All right. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our session on efficient edge computing with Aukri and WebAssembly. My name is Eugen, and I'm a product manager at Microsoft on Azure Edge and Platform. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate Goldenring, and I'm a senior software engineer at Fermion, and we're focused on serverless WebAssembly. So as this crowd may be pretty familiar with, there are many challenges with edge computing today. So imagine you have a bustling ecosystem with diverse devices working together on a factory floor, a hospital, um, retail warehouse, um, and there are thousands of edge sensors that publish data and they each speak their own protocols. And servers need to be able to discover these devices and continually be able to harness the data to get the insights from the edge. So today, Kate and I'll be talking about an open source toolkit for serverless WebAssembly applications on the edge. So Aukri, um, I'm currently a maintainer of Aukri today, and this is a CNCF sandbox project for dynamically bridging your IoT Leaf devices to your edge Kubernetes cluster. And Kate is really involved with SpinCube, which is a relatively new open source project for efficiently being able to run WASM applications on Kubernetes. So I want to quickly touch on the tiny edge. And the tiny edge is comprised of your IoT Leaf devices. Um, this means sensors, cameras, actuators, you name it. And these all have even more challenges. So these tiny edge devices, they speak different protocols. They have different topologies and um, varying authentication requirements like certificates, username, password, et cetera. These IoT Leaf devices often also have intermittent availability and downtime, and they're too small, too old to run Kubernetes on themselves today. And in order to ma make these available to your Kubernetes cluster and workloads, there's a lot of manual configuration that's required. So how can we address these pain points? Well, we have the CNCF project, Aukri, which stands for a Kubernetes resource interface. And funnily enough, it also means edge in Greek. And Aukri discovers your non-Kubernetes devices exposed on different protocols. And it also stores which um, nodes it's attached to so that you can make them available to your workloads and deploy them to the right nodes. So these devices are registered as Kubernetes extended resources, which can be easily requested by your pods. Aukri standardizes the method for storing and passing in secrets for authenticating the devices to be actually able to access the data. And Aukri is also built to be extensible. So today in the open source repos repository, we support OPC UA, OnViv, and UDEV. But you can also easily extend it to discover more devices by creating a new discovery handler in any language that you want. And we also have some templates in our repository that can help you get started. So briefly going over the Aukri architecture, um, first you start with the configuration CR. So the Aukri configuration is where you tell it what kind of devices you want to look for. So say you have an OnViv IP camera on your network that you want to discover and do some basic frame processing with. So in the configuration, you would specify that you want to use the OnViv protocol. And then from there, the OnViv discovery handler would be deployed. And once your discovery handler finds the camera on your network, it will communicate with our Aukri agent to create an Aukri instance on your cluster. And this actually helps you track the availability and usage of your device so that your app, whatever it is, frame processing, AI inferencing, can actually consume the Aukri resources. So let's look at this pod deployment YAML to be able to consume your Aukri resource. As you can see in the bottom, you can request our Aukri IoT devices just as you would CPU and memory. So here we're saying that we want one MQTT sound sensor, um, which we'll be actually using later on in our demo today. Um, but once this is specified, Aukri will actually reserve one sound sensor for you so that it can be consumed by your app. Now let's just look at the container spec here. Um, 
here we're specifying app latest, and this OCI artifact doesn't actually have to be your traditional container image. Um, so before we explore some alternatives, let's look at the pain points of using containers on Kubernetes today. So containers are often bloated with a bunch of operational and system dependencies, which means that your application is made to be less portable and makes for more complex app configurations. Containers are also quite slow to start up and scale up or down. And according to Datadog, more than 80% of container spend is wasted on idle resources. So what are some of the alternatives? Yeah, so uh, like I mentioned at the start, I'm pretty passionate about WebAssembly, and we saw in that pod spec that didn't have to be an OCI artifact that pointed to a container. It could actually be something else like WebAssembly. Uh, but before we go into that, uh, what is WebAssembly? So as it sounds, WebAssembly originated in a browser, and it was a way to write extensions and other applications for the browsers in languages other than JavaScript. And so it's this polyglot way of writing applications that all compile down to one bytecode. So I can write my application and Go, Python, JavaScript, Rust, whatever can compile to WebAssembly. And now I have this .wasm file that I can run anywhere where there's a WebAssembly runtime, whether that's locally on my machine, in the cloud, on the edge, across operating systems and architectures. There's no cross-compiling. Uh, this one .wasm file can go anywhere. But why does it matter in the context of the edge? Um, WebAssembly is not only portable, but it's also very small. So an Express.js app, which might be containerized about 300 megabytes, is three megabytes when compiled to WebAssembly. Uh, a Rust application, uh, just a simple hello world, 200 kilobytes. Um, so that's great when you're trying to send these artifacts from the edge to the cloud. Um, having smaller artifacts is great for that. But even more importantly, WebAssembly has a really strong security sandbox. It originated in the browser where we had untrusted multi-tenant code. So it needed that strong sandbox, and that's continued as it's left the browser. So the way WebAssembly works is it's isolated in linear memory, and it has capability-based security. So that WebAssembly component isn't going to have access to any resources unless explicitly granted access to by the host. And most importantly, WebAssembly has instant startup times. So unlike containers and micro VMs, which can take hundreds of milliseconds to start, WebAssembly starts up in less than a millisecond. So we can actually scale up our applications instantly. Um, and so WebAssembly it may be new to a lot of people, but there's actually a lot of tooling out there to get you started with it. The project that I maintain and my company started developing three years ago is called Spin, um, and it's fully open source, and it aims to give you a really quick start to writing serverless WebAssembly applications. So just with three commands, spin new, you scaffold your application up, spin build, you've now built that .wasm file, and spin up, you're running it locally. And because it's serverless, it's event-driven. So certain events are gonna trigger different parts of your application. So you can have HTTP requests trigger your application, or it can be subscribed to some Redis queue, or uh, respond to extra messages in an SQS uh, message queue, or command. You can directly invoke your WebAssembly component, which is actually great for init containers on Kubernetes. Um, the one we're gonna show uh, soon is MQTT, so you can trigger your application um, on updates to an MQTT topic, or you can even plug in your own. And we talked about the local experience, so I can spin it up locally, but you can actually take spin other places. So Fermion, we have um, a serverless platform for uh, multi-tenant WebAssembly, so you can just spin deploy, and now it's hosted in our cloud. And that is, um, we have one listener that can run thousands of WebAssembly applications on each node, and we're orchestrating with Nomad. Um, we also offer SpinCube, which we submitted to the CNCF, and it is a, um, a combination of four projects across companies, Microsoft, Liquid Reply, SUSE, and us at Fermion, to make it easier to run serverless WebAssembly on Kubernetes. And we actually just added a marketplace offering um, to AKS two days ago, and you can also run this on EKS, GKE, RKE, all the KEs. Um, and to kind of break down SpinCube a little bit more, uh, it's made up of four projects, all open sourced. It starts with this container D shim. So under the hood, what's happening is that instead of container D executing a container with run C, it's executing WebAssembly with run WASI, um, which is another open source project that this is powered by. 
Um, and what that means is you get all the native Kubernetes, ex Kubernetes experiences you're used to. You're running it as a pod, even though under the hood it's WebAssembly. So the same networking, all of that is layered on top of this. And then, of course, we have our favorite things in Kubernetes, a, spin, a Kubernetes operator. Um, and the spin operator, we have a custom resource to define your WebAssembly application and make sure it gets deployed. Uh, the runtime class manager is what makes sure the shim is loaded on all of your, your nodes in your cluster. And then we have a plugin to help you scaffold our, our custom resource for our operator. And this just walks through those flow, that flow of using those four projects. You scaffold your application, then you um, apply it to your cluster, the spin operator responds, creates your deployment of WebAssembly applications, um, and all of this was after your runtime class manager made sure you had the shim there. And we're about to demo this too. So this is our demo, um, and actually we're gonna do it live here, and we also are gonna have it at four different booths across the expo floor um, tomorrow when that opens up. And the idea here is that, I don't know about y'all, but I really don't like my badge being scanned. I have no clue why, but it's just something. Um, but I understand that marketing needs those metrics about engagement with a booth. And so what if we could use something else as a proxy for engagement? Uh, what if we could use the sound level around a booth as a proxy for how many people are engaging with that booth? So with that in mind, we um, set up a few Arduino devices and plugged a sound sensor on top of it. And we're putting one of these at each of four booths, Microsoft, Ampere, Akamai, and ours at Fermion. And what this is doing is this is publishing a volume, a vibration uh, measurement of volume between zero and 1,600 to an MQTT broker that we're hosting on AKS. And then we have a spin app deployed to AKS that's going to be listening to that. It's going to be triggered by that topic. And it's going to persist that volume level to a SQLite database. And then we have a back end that you can query to get certain time series sets of data from that database, and a front end that displays the sound levels at each of these booths so we can be competitive about who has the most rowdy booth. Um, so we're going to go ahead and demo this live with Aukri as well. Um, I will say I've had network issues, so we might need to fake the device, but we're going to go for it, so we'll see. Um, okay, so to start out, I want to go to the spin app. We talked about that spin, uh, spin new, spin build, spin up. We're skipping the spin new because we built our application already. But the first thing to look at when you see a spin application is it's spin.toml. This is the manifest where you define your serverless WebAssembly application. So in this one, um, we have three main components. The first one is our MQTT message persister. And this is the one that listens to that topic and will persist messages to the SQLite database. And you can see it's triggered um, by MQTT updates. So you see here the trigger of the that part of the application is MQTT. And because we're persisting it, we're explicitly giving that component access to a SQLite database. This is that capability-based security part. If I hadn't given this access to a SQL database, it wouldn't have been able to access it. We're saying you can't make any outbound host calls, so if this tries to like call home like log4j, that will fail. So that's our first component. Our second one is our backend API. It needs access to that SQLite database, so we gave it access. Our third one's our front end. It doesn't need to access the database, but it does need to access our stat static front end files, so we give it access to that. Um, and from there, we can go ahead and run it locally. So right here, you can see I'm combining the build step and the up step. So build up, I'm specifying um, a migration file to apply on a local SQLite database to create the, um, the structure, the schema I need for the database. I'm um, configuring these variables for that MQTT persisting app, namely, what is the broker we're listening to? what is the username and password for subscribing to that broker. All of that I'm doing um, via environment variables, which is one of a few ways to provide application variables to spin. And that's important to note because later, Aukri will be the one providing that connectivity information, namely the broker address and the topic. So I'm gonna build and run this locally. Uh, what this is doing is for each of those components, one's written in JavaScript, one in Go, one in Rust, it's building those, creating WebAssembly components for each. And now we're about to serve it up locally. Um, so we're up. And I forgot to check. We should probably check to see if this device is working. If it's not, we're gonna have to do our fake out. So um, let's subscribe and see if we're getting anything published. Hello, anyone there? Woohoo! 
I don't think we're getting anything, so we might have to fake this. Anyone home? Okay, we're gonna fake it. So let's go back here. What I have is so just a simple script that's going to use MQTTX, which is just a MQTT client, and it's going to publish random values to our broker. So this is our sound device now. All right, so let's go test and make sure this is working now. Great, so now we're getting accurate sound values. Um, okay, so we're back. And you can see now um, our application's getting triggered. It's logging the values. And so let's go to the browser and look at this front end. And we can see that we're getting um, updates as more and more values are coming in over time. So that's great. Uh, we have that local experience. But let's go to Kubernetes now. We're at KubeCon. So let's go back to our application. We said that WebAssembly can be an OCI artifact just like a container. So let's go ahead and, and build that and push it. So the next step is um, we're going to push this up to a registry. So spin has a built-in command for this. I'm doing spin registry push. Um, and I'm gonna try and make this a little bit bigger. Um, spin registry push. So I'm pushing to GHCR and wrapping my WebAssembly component into an OCI artifact form, which has been standardized by the WebAssembly working group within the CNCF. Great, so that's pushing up to a registry. And then oh, now it's already pushed, great. Uh, let's go to our cluster now. So we have two nodes in our cluster in AKS. Um, we have no um, application pods, but we do have SpinCube installed. So we can verify that um, because we have KWASM, which is a nickname for the runtime class manager, has successfully completed its job on each node, so it's put the shim there, and we have the spin operator running. So let's first install Aukri to discover this device. And the way we're gonna do that is we're just going to install its Helm chart, and then we're gonna enable the agent, which does the discovery, and we're gonna deploy the MQTT discovery handler. So that's one of when Eugen was talking about how you can add your own discovery handler, SUSE created this MQTT discovery handler to be able to discover MQTT-based devices in Aukri. I'm also updating the agent cluster role because we're going to be using secrets to authenticate with um, our devices, so I'm giving the agent ability to read secrets. Cool. And let's go ahead and we have the agents running and our discovery handler is now running as well. So let's now apply that configuration file, which was what Eugene was saying, tells Aukri what to discover. So we're saying this is the broker name, this is the broker topic, any device that publishes to a topic there, create a new Aukri instance for it so we can request that resource. Uh, we're passing in discovery properties, which is where you put the credentials you need to interact with your device. So this is for our broker. And then, uh, yeah, we can go ahead and apply this. So now we can see our configuration was applied. And let's see if we get any instances. We've got an instance, so that's our fake device. Um, and that is now representing the MQTT sound sensor, and we can now request it in a workload. So if we uh, want to scaffold up a spin application now, let's look at the, um, what was the artifact? Yeah, okay, let's grab this. So I can do a spin cube scaffold from and pass the OCI artifact, and this will start to help me create this spin app. But we know we wanna use Aukri, so we wanna add resources and do a bit more with this. So I've um, created a spin app for us that we can use. So it looks very similar at the start. We're using our image, uh, we're using the container D shim executor, and here's where we're requesting that, that device. Uh, with as a resource request, and notice here we're not specifying the broker address nor the topic. Aukri will inject that into the pod when it's created as connectivity information. 
And we have a secret here because um, we're, you can, the, we're persisting the data to a Terso SQL database. And so we need that um, Terso information there. All right, so we've applied that. Let's look at our pod start going. All right, we had a little restart, but here we go. Okay, so we're running, and we have a service. Um, the spin operator not only creates your deployment for you, but it also puts a service in front of it. So just like with any other service, we can go ahead and port forward it and go back to our browser. And let's just open up a new one. And here we are again. So this is now coming from Kubernetes rather than locally on my host. And we're once again uh, getting these sound values from this device. And all of that is WebAssembly, including the front end. Uh, you can just see, we can choose our time range all time. And all of this is coming from our Terso database. The back end WebAssembly API is pulling that. Front end is querying it. And the MQTT persister is persisting that data. And Aukri successfully passed that connectivity information over to the application. So yeah, that's our demo, um, kind of bringing all these technologies together. And we'll come back to this. And I guess I was supposed to show you this before I showed you this, but yeah, that's exactly where it happened. We put that spin um, WebAssembly app as an OCI artifact just where we would put a container. And we requested resources just as we would CPU and memory. And if you want to see more of this, uh, a deeper dive into the demo, um, we'll be doing booth demos at the Microsoft um, booth from 2 to 3 p.m. tomorrow, and then at the SUSE booth on Thursday from 2.45 to 3.30. So if you want a deeper dive. We also have an Aukri booth. If you want to learn more about Aukri, we're always looking for maintainers and contributors, so please stop by on Thursday morning. And then if you just want to chat, um, we have a SpinCube channel on the CNCF and an Aukri channel on the Kubernetes Slack. So, and here are some extra documentation if you just want to start reading more about it now. Uh, and with that, I think we may have a few minutes for questions. Um. So the WebAssembly images are not running on, on the IoT devices themselves. Am I understanding that correctly? Correct. So I guess I'm, it's just not quite clicking in my brain. What, what would be the motivation for eschewing traditional container images in this use case in favor of the WebAssembly if they're not running on the, on the IoT devices themselves where you might want a smaller image for that? Feel free to stop by the booth if you have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you.